If you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans uh, chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, and um, while you're turning there, um, you just say Bible class, I was telling Ben, it went perfect, really, he didn't know what I was talking about this week, and I didn't know what he was talking about, um, but it went perfect with what we are discussing this morning as we talk about being living sacrifices in our relationships as it pertains to the governments of the land. Um, and certainly I'm not trying to put any restrictions on us that go beyond what God has called us to. This morning, what we've simply tried to recognize, and, 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 and I hope that my, my examples have been true to the general principles, is number one, that part of being a living sacrifice is recognizing that the systems God has put in place, God has put in place. He has put in place for whatever reason, I may not know what it is, um, God has put in place for a reason and for a purpose, and ultimately, through the system of the authorities, God is trying to do something good, not just for us, but for everyone. Uh, it's one of those things that's really similar to what, what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, when he talks about God sending the rain on the evil and the good and causing the sun to rise on the just and on the unjust. The, the, the benefits of the govern, government are for everyone. Without it, things would be absolutely chaotic. And though we may be discouraged at times and what what is happening decisions that may be being made and by the fact that sometimes we do have to disobey out of greater allegiance to God but let's make sure that we still approach this from a biblical perspective that when not called to disobey God we have a responsibility to be subject to submit and as we get towards the end of our text to respect and honor uh, certainly there is a lot of things that go on within the context of our governing authorities, but that's just because they're part of this world, just, just like um, all who are outside of Christ. And I think the thought that Ben brought up in Bible class is really the essence of what's being talked about by Paul in Romans 13, as we'll look a little bit later in 1 Peter chapter 2, when he says, when, when aside from submit and subject, he comes at it with the perspective that he does in verse 3 of Psalm 37 when he says, trust in the Lord and do good. I think that's a big part of Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2. That it's not just about submission, but in the end when he turns to respect and honor, he brings it back to something we've kind of been trying to bring up a little bit more lately. That we are people on mission and even through our submission and subjection, uh, we are effectively being the lights that we are being called to be. Trust in the Lord and do good. Be faithful where you can be faithful. Uh, and and, and God, is, God, God will give that vindication that was talked about. Let's go back to Romans 13. <clears throat> Romans chapter 13. This is where, let's see. Um, get this. There it is. This is where we left off. He's acknowledging that God has put these things into place uh, as servants and ministers for our good. And the simple call in all of this is submit. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's essentially the big idea of this text. He has called us to submit out of greater allegiance to God as the one who has put these things into place in 1 Peter chapter 2. Submit uh, as unto the Lord is, is what Peter is going to add in that text. But we want to ask the question now. Obviously, we, we, we know what, what the, the call is within the context of the ideal. But the question then becomes, what if the authorities are unjust? Okay, so God, God um, puts these authorities into place. And the text tells us that he put them in place for a good reason. And when the system is working as it's supposed to be working, from Romans 13, 1 through 7, here's what's supposed to happen. Evil is supposed to be punished, and good is supposed to be rewarded. That's the system as God designed it. Well... If that's the purpose for which God created it, does our responsibility change when the system doesn't fulfill faithfully the role that it was given? Biblical text actually deals 
with that question, and I think it's going to be important for us to consider. But one of the first things that I have to simply acknowledge is we have to bring this back into the context. While Paul is giving the ideal and the design of God, it's similar to what we have when we talk about how God made us in his image and made us holy, but yet, what's the reality? When we took sin into our lives, none is righteous, no, not one. Though the ideal is being presented, we're also faced with the reality that there has never been a system that has faithfully lived out the purpose that God gave it in its fullest extent, in a perfect way. Okay, I'm not talking about just generally. I mentioned even earlier, in our day and in our time, I have still enough confidence that I could call the police right now if someone broke into my home and, and expect that what should happen is going to happen. I realize there are some places in our country right now where that's just not the case, and, and, and I hate that for them. But there is still this question, when that is the scenario, when things aren't in the ideal, and things aren't as they ought to be, what must we do? How should we respond? Well, it's here that I think it's especially important to look beyond this text just a little bit because, number one, Paul doesn't take the time to deal with it. Uh, he doesn't take the time to deal with this text. He just puts general principles there. But somebody else does deal with it. Peter actually deals with it in 1 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to put the text up here in just a second. That is really the parallel to Romans chapter 13. It's just Peter, uh, Peter speaking it in 1 Peter chapter 2, and the text is going to be verses 13 through 17. I'm just going to put that, put that up here, and we'll read this, but I'm just going to tell you the answer is not in this text. We're going to have to zoom out and get some context uh, to deal specifically with the question, but let's understand where this is going first. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, to the governor as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Did you notice the emphasis multiple times throughout this text on when we submit ourselves to the system God put in place, it's actually submission to God? Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake. Um, this is the will of God, verse 15. But then in verse 16, living as servants of God within this context that's being spoken about in submission to authority. But you see, you can see very clearly that this text is really a, almost a, almost an identical parallel to Romans chapter thirteen, as it begins in the same way. It appeals to some of the same things in the very beginning, and it ends in the same way with the idea of honor uh, and respect. Um, but I want to zoom out from this just a little bit because what we're going to find is that the answer to our question. What when the government is not fulfilling its role is actually found within a text that comes immediately after this. What you're going to find, don't start reading ahead yet, but I'm just going to draw your attention to something. There are four, four quote-unquote, be subjects within the book of 1 Peter. And if you look there at verse 13, you have the one which is our topic for consideration this morning, be subject to the human institutions. Verse, eight, uh, verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters. Chapter 3, and in verse 1, wives, be subject to your own husbands, even an unbelieving husband, he goes on to talk about, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. But then also, a little bit more unrelated in chapter 5 is the idea of being subject, verse 5, to the elders. Um, why is it unrelated? Simply because the first three have to do with relationships between believers and often unbelievers. Okay? In the context of an eldership, it's different. We're all within the kingdom of heaven, and the command is the same, 
but we're really not, um, we're, the, the answer to the question, well, what if they're not faithfully serving the role, would probably be answered a little bit different in that context, because we hold one another responsible, right? But the first three scenarios involve uh, scenarios where it's believers and unbelievers, the human institutions, slaves and masters, wives and unbelieving husbands. And so in verse thir- uh, chapter, let's see, 1 Peter chapter 2 and in verse 18, let's read and see if this answers a little bit of the question for us as, as pertains to this idea of, sub- uh, of subjection. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect. Did you read it? Did you read ahead of me? Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Okay, let me just stop for just a second because you're thinking, well, that's specifically about slaves and masters. No, it's, it's a principle that's going to span through these different contexts. And here's how I know why. Because he's, what, what he's going to go on to talk about, what he's going to go on and talk about is he's going to allude to Jesus and how he was beaten, how he was endured. He's going to go on into a context in which it really is more about one's relationship with the higher authorities. To such an extent, he's going to even jump over in chapter 8, excuse me, in chapter 3 and in verse 8 and come back to this idea when he's really emphasizing the idea of not repaying evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing for to this you were called, which is an expectation he brings into the context of Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2. It's this idea that we are not to be those who are, who are held back by doing good, but we're actively doing good within the context of the systems God has given us. And so in verse 18, it's very relevant Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it with if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure, but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. What is he talking about? A reversal of the purpose for which God raised it up to be. Now you're being punished for good and you're being rewarded for evil. What do we do when it's unjust, when it's unfair? Well, you're going to suffer. That's what's going to happen. A great majority of this book, 1 Peter, is about suffering And about how suffering is directly tied to the fact that you're in exile, which is something that we completely miss sometimes and we don't want to embrace. It's this idea that we are in the world, but not of the world, but we live on a heavenly plane. And and, and when we get super involved and and bogged down in the things of this life, we're like soldiers getting involved in civilian affairs. Let Let me borrow that language from Timothy. Let's go over to Timothy, 1 Timothy, for just a second. This is not to say we shouldn't be concerned. This is not to say that within the confines of the law, we cannot let our voice be heard. It's not that at all. We can. We have that, we have that opportunity and we have that, um, that option to us. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. What is he saying? He says, we're in an army that doesn't even belong to this world. And yet that becomes the conversation that dominates our hearts and our minds and our worries and our concerns and our anxieties. First Peter is all about a people that he refers to as exiles living in a foreign land. And what he says is conduct yourselves like Exiles, live in tandem with the kingdom to which you belong. Recognize that when the world sees otherworldly people, you're going to suffer for it. Even if what you're doing is good, you'll suffer at the hands of the civil authorities, at the hands of your neighbor, at the hands of your family, whoever it may be, you will suffer and you will suffer unjustly. And when it happens, stay mindful of God Verse 19, and endure doing good, verse 20, 
knowing that this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. I mean, to me, that's the biblical answer. It's not the answer I think we want to come to sometimes. Because we get pretty bogged down sometimes in our rights as citizens of this country. You remember what Paul wrote to the Philippians? Philippians chapter 3. Verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior. The Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, we belong to a different country. Okay, again, that doesn't mean that we don't care about what happens in this world. But God has given us the weapon to engage this world, right? And, and he, he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says, pray for all those who are in positions of authority so that you can live a quiet and godly life. Let that be your prayer and not just that, but do good and be lights and show honor and show respect. What if the government does not meet the ideal? The government's never met the ideal. Even in Israel, in the Old Testament, it didn't meet the ideal. We can count the good kings with our hands. Because the vast majority of them went after the ways of the world. Were involved in great injustices. But yet, even in the midst of it, David would not put his hand out against the king. Daniel wouldn't put his hand out against the king. Joseph didn't raise up a rebellion. He simply lived faithfully in the sight of his God, fulfilled his obligations, sought the good of those who were around him, that's really where the text goes in Romans chapter 13. Here's what God has put these positions in place for. When it comes to you, fulfill your obligations. Obey the law, verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes. You know, that's not the one, that's not the specific thing I brought up. I brought up, you know, the speed limit and all that kind of stuff, but but that was just, that's just sometimes the first thing that comes to my head. What about taxes? Let's just, let's just bring this very, very practically. Do you, do you pay your taxes? Great, that's good. Do you, do you, are you completely honest with your taxes? There are legitimate, and I'm assuming that's the answer is yes for everybody in this room. I'm not casting doubt there. You examine and test yourself against that, but. Let me, let me just present a scenario to you, and you can question it in your mind. So when I bought my blue truck, some of you know my blue truck, I bought it on eBay um, and had it shipped to me. And the guy that I was in communication with, when he sent me the title, he said, I left the sales price blank for you to do whatever you want with. You know what that means, right? I can put whatever number in there and potentially avoid quite a bit of money on sales tax. What, what would you do? That's where integrity is put to the test. That's where a higher allegiance is put to the test. When you're not going to get caught in the world, when there is no one to see, in those moments it becomes very clear Ultimately, who even through the course or the, 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 sub, the systems of the law, whether you truly see that you are serving the Lord Jesus. At the very end of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to it and then I'm going to come back. I'm going to give you this. I don't want to just give it to you at the end anymore. I want to repeat it a few times, but... 
Here's the idea of Romans chapter 13 and 1 Peter 2. Christians ought to be the best of citizens out of allegiance to God and as those who are always, 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 always on mission. Christians ought to be the best of citizens out of allegiance to God and as those who are always on mission. Not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust. Here's the other thing I want to bring out from this text. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. When he was reviled, the text says, he did not revile in return. There was no deceit found in his mouth. He committed no sin. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. He just all along kept entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Well, would he have us do the same? Absolutely he would, because if you turn over just two chapters in 1 Peter chapter 4 in the context of suffering as Christians and sharing in Christ's sufferings as a result of being a Christian not suffering as people who are breaking the law. We're not suffering as verse 15 says, murderers or thieves or meddlers, but we're suffering as Christians, those who are simply doing what is good and what is right and we're honoring God in all that we do. He says, you will suffer. But in verse 19, he says, therefore let those who suffer do exactly what he said Jesus did in 1 Peter chapter 2. And this comes back to what Ben was talking about a lot in Psalm 37. Trusting in God and just doing good. He says he just kept trust, entrusting him, his soul to a faithful creator. He says now to Christians, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The phrase be subject is found four times in Peter, three times that are really relevant to what we're talking about in this first instance implying relationships between believers and non-believers. And then the allusion to Christ is that example that, and that he submitted himself and calls us to emulate him. There is a call in chapter 4 and in verse 1 that I think is, is worthy of our attention. <clears throat> Submission of authority, servants and masters, the wives and the husbands, it's all about subjection out of a greater allegiance to Christ and about being on mission, which we'll highlight in just a second. But he continues the thought of Jesus all the way down through the end of chapter 3. Even there in verse 18, Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. But in chapter 4 and in verse 1, alluding to everything that he's talked about and that mindset and, and, and that attitude and and, and that perception of, of, of how we are to see ourselves and what we are to do and how are we to respond and what we're willing to go through. He says in chapter 4 and in verse 1, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. That's what we're trying to discern, isn't it? It was kind of interesting. He uses, he uses armor language, which shows us that in Ephesians chapter 6, you don't have every piece of it. Another bit of the armor that we are to put on is the armor of thinking. We arm ourselves with the way of thinking that is characterized by Jesus Christ and his willing to suffer at the hands of lawless men. Arm yourselves, he says. <clears throat> and then here's kind of where it comes to. So at the end of Romans chapter 13, you stay, stay there in 1 Peter ch chapter 2. At the end of Romans chapter 13, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed. 
Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Someone might come into that text and say, well, if, 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 if I'm to respect and honor people who I owe it to, then wouldn't that imply that there's people that I don't owe it to? Not if you believe what Steve Fontenot was talking about in his gospel meeting. The whole essence of his, the whole essence of his theme was duties based on relationships. Duties based on relationships. What relationship do I share with every other human being that's ever been made? It's that they were made fearfully and wonderfully in the image of God, holy to him, and that God desires them to be saved, and that they are worthy of my effort and my pursuit and my shedding the light of Jesus Christ. Honor doesn't mean that I agree with everything they do, with everything they support. It doesn't mean that I just accept, embrace the life they're living and don't call sin, sin. It's not what it means at all. Jesus was dying on the cross because of the people who were all standing around Him because their sin, they were lost. But yet, Isaiah tells us he opened not his mouth and there was no deceit and he didn't revile. He refused to stoop to their level. There is a distinction between what is deserved and what is owed. Again, does that mean that we agree with what the government does? No. Does that mean we don't have the right to speak on behalf of God's truth concerning those things? No. Does that mean that I can't vote to put someone else in power? No. Those things are perfectly acceptable. Those things are all within the confines of the law, and we have the right to our opinions and our voices. But we must also not neglect at the same time this foundational idea that Christ died for all men. He has universally invited all men through the blood of His Son because all creation is His. And by nature of the human relationship, respect and honor are to be given out of respect for all. Because the position of authority is given by God, I respect and I honor. Because mankind are made in the image of God, I respect and I honor. I'm going to read to you a quote from a book. Um, I think this was a commentary. I failed to write down which one I got it out of. but, But this author writes this. He says, the meaning seems to be that we take up once for all as a permanent stance the attitude of respect for all. In practice, this works out as continuously loving the brotherhood of believers, fearing God, honoring the king. Christians may increasingly appreciate their special status and privileges as children of God, but that is no reason for looking down upon others. All that believers are and can become is solely by the grace of God and to guard against such false suppositions of superiority They are to make sure that they show proper respect to all. Respect is due to others as fellow human beings, irrespective of any particular position that they may hold. I think maybe our understanding of honor for everyone could be helped um, could be helped by um, sorry, I I thought I was I thought I'd skip something. I was trying to figure out where it was. But I think sometimes I think maybe our idea and understanding of honor could be helped by the way in which we understand what Jesus says when he tells us to love our enemies. You remember our definition we use for the word love? We say it's biblical definition is, is again, borrowed from Tim Norman, always wanting and doing what is truly best. And so we may have enemies. They hate us for what we do, and we stand opposed to what they are in the life that they're, be, they're living, but would we hesitate to give them the gospel? Well, no, we wouldn't do that because we want what's best for them. That's love. And so we will respond to evil with good because we love and we want what's best for them. We love our enemies. We're going to pray for those who persecute us. It's the idea that we are wishing them well and regarding the welfare of by nature of the fact that they are made in the image of God. It is the idea of blessing as opposed to cursing, which is a thought picked up by Paul in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12 and in verse 14, it's a text that we've already touched on. In Romans chapter 12 and in verse 14, he says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do 
not curse them. It's the idea, I believe, of what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 40. When in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, in the context of loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you and not responding to evil with evil and going the second mile, this is the idea of blessing right here. If someone would sue you and take your tunic, Jesus says, let him have your cloak as well. That's the idea of blessing. Blessing an enemy of God. Does it mean I have to agree with them? No. Does it mean I approve of their lifestyle or what they stand for? No. Does it mean that I can't speak against the things that they do? No. But with gentleness and respect and honor as one who in all things is adorning the doctrine of Christ. Which is a phrase used in the context of the other two be subject circumstances in 1 Peter chapter 2. The two times the phrase adorn the doctrine of Christ is used is in the context of women in 1 Timothy 2.9 and bond servants in Titus 2.10. The idea is in our interactions with the world around us, we are to clothe ourselves with the teachings of Jesus, with the life of Jesus, with the character of Jesus, with the love of Jesus, Are you adorning the doctrine of Christ? Am I adorning the doctrine of Christ? I'm going to read to you um, from a a book I have. It's one of my favorite books. Um, I'm rereading it right now. And this, the subject of 1 Peter chapter 2 comes up. And it's a book on 1 Peter. But in the section where he deals with the section on 1 Peter chapter 2, he kind of walks through the text. and, And basically what he does is he just, puts his own words to this section of the text in 1 Peter chapter 2, and it really um, really simplifies it and clarifies it well. I'm just going to read it to you. It'll just, it'll just take a, a minute or two. <clears throat> Bless those who persecute you. Be kind to them with your words and wish them well. Don't curse them to their face or berate them behind their back. Instead, when they are happy, be happy for them, even with them. Rejoice at their successes. Tell them how glad you are when they get a raise or a new grandbaby. Be sorry for their losses. Weep and mourn when they are sorrowful. When they lose a loved one or even suffer the natural consequences of their sin, don't say, serves you right. Instead, live in harmony with one another. Do what you can get, do what you can to get along. Don't look for ways to spite them and don't create unnecessary strife. That would be a proud attitude. You are no better than them, so be humble toward everyone and associate with the people beneath you. Dignify the poor and the ill. Show lavish honor to your employees and contractors and vendors, to your babysitter and to your children. Take time to talk with the people no one else will talk to. Don't be too big for your own britches and don't take other people's bad behavior as your opportunity to be bad yourself. Instead, live a completely honorable life because the world is watching if at all possible live at peace with everyone this won't always work some people will hate you no matter what but that's not your concern never seek revenge God has your back one day he will exalt you and judge them but today your job is to show them the utmost respect So if your opponent is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. In any way you wish to be loved, in every way you would wish to be loved, demonstrate tangible love to your enemies. And if at the end they still want to be your enemy and God's, then God will deal with it. By the way, this is a paraphrase of Romans 12, 12 through 14. 14 through 21. Romans 12, 14 through 21. But today your job is to show them the utmost respect. So if your opponent is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. In every way you would wish to be loved, demonstrate tangible love to your enemies. And if at the end they still want to be your enemy and God's, he'll deal with it. Don't let their evil overtake you. You overwhelm them with good. Good. 
And if you look in your Bibles, Romans chapter 12, 14 through 21, you're going to see that the outline of what I just read falls perfectly with what he has in that section. What principles are being reinforced from this text in Romans chapter 13 that are New Testament wide, not specifically spelled out in this text, but what principles does it allude to? As we kind of wrap up this morning, um, the conclusion of this text talks about respect and honor. And to honor others is simply this. Here's a good definition that I came across and, and, and I think really fits the context well. To honor others is to have a genuine care and concern. To have a genuine care and concern. Do you remember what the accusation against Eli in the Old Testament was when his, when his sons continued to do evil? If you go back in that text, God tells Eli, you have honored your sons above me by not disciplining them. And the idea there is that you have shown more concern for them then you've shown concern for my holy law. It's about care and concern. It doesn't mean that we agree or that we affirm. It simply means that out of honor, we overcome evil with good. We give where good is needed. All in an effort to show people the light of Jesus Christ. I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. So this is actually a text we looked at fairly recently, within the last couple of weeks, and we did it very briefly. There in, there in chapter 2 and in verse 20 through 21, it talks about vessels for honorable use. We kind of talked about this in connection with the Holy Spirit. He says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, and useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. What does that text tell you? Well, it tells you that God doesn't cleanse you just to cleanse you. He cleanses you to make you a vessel and to use you as a vessel, to use you for good works, and to be used in the kingdom of God. And I think it's interesting where he immediately goes next as Paul's writing to Timothy. And he's, as he says, so, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. For you know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Why? Because God may perhaps grant them a repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This text emphasizes three things. Number one, what it is to be what is to be considered important. There's a lot of conversations that we have and get engaged in this life and get very worked up over that really at the heart and the core of it are just worthless controversies. Are really just things that breed quarreling. Paul tells Timothy as a minister of the gospel, don't get wrapped up in that. Don't get involved with that. The second thing that he says is, this is how a servant of God is to conduct himself and to do so always. Okay, It's not just not being involved with those things, but it's about not being quarrelsome. It's about being kind to everyone. It's about, yes, being able to teach, but when teaching and doing so with correction, it's about correcting with gentleness and all along the way when evil comes at you for the sake of, of the good it's, it's about not throwing up your hands in despair and it's about not seeking to overcome that evil with evil it's more about patiently enduring evil so number one he says you need to make sure you know what's important and what's not important number two you need to make sure that you know how to conduct yourself but number three it's important Number three is simply the why. God may grant them repentance. 
God may grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. They may come to their senses having come across a gentle and respectful purveyor of the truth. Who's not trying to hit them over the head with a hammer. and Who doesn't approach every conversation by telling them they're going to hell and, 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 and all of that. Certainly the fear of God needs to be present in the conversations. But at the same time we, we, we know the wisdom of Paul as he walked into the city of Athens and didn't open his mouth with a word of condemnation, but he opened his mouth with, I perceive you are religious people. Let me tell you about my God. The creator of all that is. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. You worship an unknown God. Can I, can I tell you about him? Yes, eventually he got to, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Yeah, he eventually got there. But at the same time, he approached him in a way that was accommodated the message of the gospel. Let me just give you an example. I, don't, I, don't, I read it in this book. He's a guy who, who, <clears throat> who um, went overseas and was a missionary in... Um, a territory where nearly everyone was Muslim. You can imagine, you can imagine the great difficulty with which that would be. But obviously, evangelism approaches would be very different in that environment um, than they are here. But I, I, I think one of the stories he told is kind of an effective illustration for knowing what's important, knowing when to be silent, knowing when to speak, knowing how to show honor and respect, even though it may be undeserved, all for the sake of the greater message of being able to push the gospel. He said he, he had four guys, all of them <clears throat> Muslim background, who he would meet with regularly, and, and they would just talk about things. And it was an opportunity. He saw it as an opportunity to, to be able to slowly introduce them to the gospel as they came to trust him and as they came to see that he was a good guy, that maybe it would open up doors of opportunity. And he said one... Uh, right around the time when it was going on, all the sem- September 11th stuff was, was happening, and he was over there, and, and, and after a little while, they had one of their meetings, and <clears throat> they got together, and this, this is what the other guys wanted to talk about. And, of course, from that perspective, it was all a conspiracy by our government, and that's what they were talking about, and that's what they were going back and forth, and the guy said, I just sat there and listened, and he said, every ounce of blood in my body was boiling. I wanted nothing more than to put them in their place and to tell them what I knew to be true and and, 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 and what happened. But he said, I let them talk. And I stayed silent. You want to know why? He says, because he knew that if he got involved in that argument, he was done as one who could put the gospel forward they would effectively be turned off at that point. And that's what we do, I think, sometimes with our conversations when it comes to politics. We care about what's going on in the country. I care about it. And, and, and we pray for our leaders. And given the opportunity to vote, I will vote. And I will tell people what I think. But at the end of the day, my greater allegiance is to Christ and the gospel. And if being silent means creating an opportunity, we have to be content to be silent. And to show honor, even when we feel it's undeserved. My job, again, is to bless. That is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. In Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 46, what sets us apart is that we love those who don't just love us. Verse 43, excuse me, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies, what's been told to you, but I'm telling you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do that. If you greet only your, greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Living sacrifice. The mercies of God that touch every aspect of my being in every corner of my life. 
even this corner of my life. I want to close with some fundamental truths that we must never lose sight of, no matter what conversation we're having or what topic we're, we're discussing. And then just very briefly at the end, some very practical things that I think will help us with this in the everyday. Number one, we must never forget we are not of this world and that our citizenship is in heaven. We must never forget that while in this world, we have obligations to fulfill in greater allegiance to Christ, whether that be to our government, whether it be as as em, uh, employees to our employer, whether that be to our spouses or to our parents, whatever context the submission we're being called to comes in. While in this world, we recognize we have obligations to fulfill, but we do those in greater allegiance to Christ. Number three, don't let your worldly concern cloud your heavenly vision. The quality of the country may, be, may get better. The quality of the country may get worse. The country may be overcome by another nation. Isaiah writes in chapter 40 and 23 to 24, God brings princes to nothing. He makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he then blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. That's the cycle of history. And we shouldn't be surprised by that. No matter how much we want to believe it, this is not God's country. All countries are God's country. The whole world is God's and everything and everyone in it. And He is a God who is not a God of partiality. And if the worst comes to be in this country, guess what? We will be okay because we belong to a kingdom that can't be shaken. And it is that kingdom that we will find our rest in, and it is that country that we will speak of, and it is that country to which we will implore people to follow. And lastly, everything you do in this life, every context, every interaction is to be done with the intent to draw people to the thing that, or the one that is their true salvation. And that is Jesus Christ. We ought to be the absolute best citizens out of our greater allegiance to Christ and as people who see that we are always on mission. Practically, let me just offer some suggestions. You may disagree with some of these. We can talk about them. You may have some of your own that are helpful. But let me just say one of these specifically, it's purely from a personal experience level, but it may not be true with you. But let me, just, let me just start at the very beginning with one we have to come to agreement on, and it's simply this. God calls us to submit to and obey the laws of the land as far as we are able in connection with the will of God and to do so with integrity as one who is serving Christ. Not because I'm afraid of getting caught, but because I know that God has put the system in place and he's put it in place for good. Pay your taxes. Do it with integrity. Follow the limits and the laws and the expectations. Don't go hunting until opening day. Only get your limit. Every scenario we could bring in, we could bring in. But in all things, submit where you're able out of allegiance to Christ and respect for his prescribed order. Number two, reconsider how you talk about those who are in authority or even more generally those with whom you disagree. We're going to talk to a similar, um, a similar um, topic within the next probably month or so as pertains to a Q&A question that was recently given to me. Um, but... Some of this is going to apply. We'll, we'll come back to that um, a little bit later concerning what responsibility do we have towards maybe business, businesses now that are really pushing a lot of stuff that we, we really don't like. Do we have responsibilities there? And that was the nature of the question. We're going to come back to that and talk about, talk about that in a little bit diff different light, but similar. But back story to all of it is we need to reconsider how we talk about people and specific to this context, people in power. We need to speak differently about those with whom we disagree and disapprove of, light and salt different, and make it known to all that though we disapprove, we still seek 
their ultimate good. Let me just let me just get a rise out of some of you and two na- use two names. Some of you don't want me to use, but Donald Trump and Joe Biden were both made in the image of God. And though we may disagree, and we may have our assessments and our stances, and they may be strong, and we have the right to those. We want to stand for truth and what is good and right and and, and pure and excellent. We still have a responsibility to deal respectfully and honorably. In 2 Kings chapter 5, the story is incredible. Remember the story of Naaman? 2 Kings chapter 5, you remember Naaman, don't you? Naaman was the one who had leprosy. And of course, he crosses paths with Elisha, and he is healed of that leprosy, but sometimes I think we forget a very important aspect of this story. In verse 1, Naaman, commander of the army of this king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him, the Lord actually gave victory to Syria. Guess what? He was a servant of God. He was, God was using him for specific, in specific ways and specific tasks. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of of Naaman's wife. Stop reading for just a second and just imagine the scenario. You've been taken captive by your oppressor. A little girl, the text says, can you imagine the fear, the terror in her heart as she is brought into a foreign land by force and forced to work at the hands of her oppressor and those who are high up in the armies of the oppressor. Can you imagine how bitter she could have been, how much she could have complained, how much of her prayers could have been occupied by curses for the, for, for the foreign enemies. And now, perfect scenario, her master is a leper. Wow, the temptation to sit there and think with a smile on your face, it's what you deserve. But yet this little girl who was carried off, who worked in the service of Naaman's wife, In verse 3, she said to her mistress, Would that my Lord were the prophet who is in Samaria, were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in, told his Lord, Thus and thus spoke the girl from the land of Israel. The king of Assyria said, Go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And Naaman ends up a healed man. All because this little foreign girl of Israel, who had every reason in the world to be bitter and disgruntled and wish ill of her enemy, chose to seek the favor of her captor and honor him. Refusing to wish ill, to speak ill, and rather to overcome evil with good and seek good. I think we need to reconsider the way that we see and the way we talk about people in power, especially as we come to see that they are only there because God has permitted them for a time to be there, for whatever reason they may be. And so on a very practical level, I kind of referenced this quickly earlier, but I think we need to avoid circumstances that inspire bitterness. And so I think a lot of times what's tempting is to get together with a group of men, probably even Christians or women who are like us, and to get together in a small group with people who, dis, who, who agree with us and, and are just as fired up as we are. And boy, we can just feed off of each other and we can just run them through the molehill. What are we accomplishing I used to listen a lot on the radio to AFR and then the conservative talk radio. It's like 101 something. And I do check it still every once in a while. There's nothing wrong with checking that. I I, I check in every once in a while for my news. But I had to stop listening to it every day. You want to know why? It was making my anxiety go way up. Because they talk about liberals the way liberals talk about conservatives. Conservatives. 
just dumb, stupid, and ridiculous all the time, all day long, and the despairs of the world and everything that's wrong with our country, and it was just filling my thoughts, and I started to get worried and stressed and anxious because that's what was going in all the time. I could get fired up in a moment if someone mentioned specific topics. I had to stop. We tend to be a society that when we talk about people who disagree with us, the easiest thing to do is dehumanize them. Let us make sure that that's not the case among us. You know why the woman of 1 Peter 3 was able to win her unbelieving husband without a word? The text says she does it by her respectful and pure conduct. Let's reconsider how we talk. And in order to do that, that's going to require some renewing of the mind and changing of the things that are constantly going in. But here's the thing we also need to make sure we do. We need to always be expressing hope when we're talking to anyone in the world. Anyone. We're not overcome with despair. Our joy can't be robbed with us. Why is it that you have such a good disposition despite what's going on in the world? Because I have a living hope. I have a living hope. I belong to a country where the, outcome is not, where the outcome is not grim. It's glorious. And no matter what happens in this life, that outcome's not going to change. But lastly, kind of coming back to that Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good. God has given each one of us the power to make a difference in the world. And we need to do that. We need to do good. Well, where's he given us the power? First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, in verse 1. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high places, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Pray. Pray for them. Be a prayer soldier. Pray for them. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If we want huge differences to take place in the world... I guarantee you it's going to take an intervention from God. And yet so often, rather than God, our thoughts immediately start going to the holsters, don't they? Trust in the Lord and do good. Overcome evil with good. Pray. I stopped reading. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. Why did I put the end on the last part there, pray with love and mission orientation? Because we never read this part. We need to pray for our leaders. Yeah, why? Well, to lead a quiet and godly life. That's good, right. Why is that good? Because verse 4, God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. There is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, it is for this that I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Because being able to live a quiet and godly life and a dignified life paves the way for free-throwing of the gospel. It creates the prime environment where we can speak openly about Jesus Christ and acknowledge His name and win lost souls to Him. Pray. If we commit to doing some of these, and again, you may have your own suggestions, and I welcome those. Send those to me, and I'll I'll, I'll send them out. But being the living sacrifices that God has called us to, living and walking by His will, what He deems good and acceptable and perfect. It affects every relationship that we have in this life. And this one, this one is right there in the midst of it. 
Christians ought to be the best of citizens out of allegiance to God and as those who were always, always on mission. Let's conclude this morning with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the fact that you've not just put mankind on earth to just live amidst chaos, but you've established systems intended, Father, to protect us and to provide for us uh, provisions. And Father, we pray that you would bless our authorities, that they would make decisions that would continue to allow us to live quiet, godly lives, dignified in every way. Father, we pray for all those in authority that they may have their hearts convicted by your truth and make decisions that are in keeping and alignment with your word. But Father, even if not, we pray that you would secure our hearts in you, that we would plant our feet on the rock that will not be moved, that we will see that we belong to an absolutely glorious kingdom that cannot be shaken. And Father, though we are cared, we do care about the things of this world and Father, we pray that you would help us to do what we can to elicit change. We pray that you would help us to not lose our focus and that we would let the first message from our lips, lips be the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we know that you so love the world that you sent your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, Father. And we praise you, we thank you for that. We're nothing without that. And Father, we want that for all who are made in your image. Father, help us to be the best citizens we can be, but only as we are trying to be the best citizens of a heavenly kingdom, with our eyes and our minds set on you. And Father, help us to look at every opportunity in this life, even when we find ourselves standing face to face with an enemy. Help us to look at it as an opportunity to overcome evil with good, to show respect, to show honor, to point people in your direction that they may glorify you and honor you in their own lives. Father, we pray that you would forgive us where we've sinned. Help us to learn from our mistakes, to stand up, to do better. Give us the strength. It's through your son's name that we pray. Amen. Maybe is there someone here this morning who is not yet a child of God? Um, The way of Christ is the way of hope, and he offers eternal life to all who will simply take hold of it. If you have heard the invitation and you have believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he died on the cross, was raised on the third day, and ascended to heaven where he prepares the way for all who are his. If you believe that truth, that his blood has the power to cleanse you of your sins and you're ready to respond, will you confess his name? Will you change the way you've been living? Will you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? Maybe you've done that and you've fallen away and you're ready to get back on the right track, and you you desire the prayers of this congregation, let us pray for you. Let us help you. Whatever your need may be this morning, let us know by coming forward as we stand and sing.